There was a lot of moments where we thought we lost everything. Everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. But one thing went right was the market was going up. I think the last couple of years, the prices have gone up so high that more and more people were attracted to wholesaling. But now that we're coming to a new shift in the market, you're gonna see less and less people be willing to take that financial marketing risk. So if you create a niche or focus, you could be making more money. Hey, this is Vima. Welcome to the Ready Podcast, where if you're ready to upgrade your real estate knowledge, then hit a like button and subscribe to the video and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any more of this great content. Today on the podcast, I have a guest. He's a home flipper and a wholesaler in the general Texas area. His name is Akul. And let's start off by like learning about letting my listeners learn about like kind of like your story. So how did you get into real estate? And then how did you get it all into this home flipping and the wholesaling process? Yeah, um, awesome to be here, uh, Vima. So this uh, process uh, began in 2013 in real estate. Um, it was really random, didn't plan this, didn't know anything about real estate. Um, my friend and I were kind of like, you know, driving for dollars, which is the technique that people look for when they, when they find a property that looks distressed. Um, it's Wait, you say that again? You said fine for dollars? Driving for dollars. Driving for dollars. I don't think I've ever heard that term before. Yeah, so the idea is that you drive around neighborhoods and look for distressed properties, p- properties mm-hmm. that look abandoned. Um, they might have um, old cars in the, in the front yard, mm-hmm. um, garbage everywhere, mail that hasn't been picked up. It just looks mm-hmm. like it's been vacant, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so we saw this house in, in the neighborhood that we lived in, in inner city Houston, and it was a fourplex and it was in bad shape um, and just distress physical distress right okay um we went up to we this house uh, we we looked it up on the on the local cad um mm-hmm. it was very close to where we lived and it had some bad people living there you know people mm-hmm. that weren't supposed to be living there okay. <laughs> and so and so okay. we looked it up we looked it up on the cad and we we found the owner and gave him a note dropped it off at his house and asked him if he wanted to sell okay. he actually called us back and we ended up, long story, buying the property. Okay, okay. So that's how you got kind of got started. It's just like just dry, you were just like excited to like you sold some properties and you you just started doing it online doing like internet. Just kind of the idea of like finding property by just driving around. Well, we only just did this one time. We just okay. saw this distressed property in our neighborhood. Oh, okay. So it's not like you were looking for it intended. It was like you just happened to notice it. And you're yeah. like, this isn't, you saw it as an opportunity. Exactly, right. We just saw this house. It was in bad shape. We're like, let's talk to the owners. And, and it's just the process of driving for dollars, which is just finding a, mm-hmm. a crappy property in the neighborhood and talking right. to the owners. So how did you go from like doing this one property to now? Now you do a lot more than just one. You do like at least 100 plus or at least you've done at least 100 plus or so now so how do you go from that to doing so many more yeah yeah so in my in my career over 100 plus um it got thing closer to like 140 ish 150 okay. since i started so um and that was that that property was like five or six years ago that was a that wasn't so that was a property we bought with the intent and with the idea of building new homes on it so we ended mm-hmm. up building some new homes um, but subsequently after that is mm-hmm. you asked like, how did I get to there from there to where I'm at? Mm-hmm. And, um, we wanted to shorten the life cycle of each deal. That mm-hmm. first deal took like a couple years, right? Mm-hmm. And not to get paid for a couple years was hard. Yeah. Um, that's a lot of time to not get paid. Yeah. And then we started to flip houses and when you flip houses, that still takes about six months. Um, you know, for the cash to come when it cash goes out just, to the cash you. goes from the ca- when the cash comes back in again. So then I figured, okay, if I get paid every six months now, well, now I need to shorten that cycle again. And so that's when I discovered wholesaling. And so that is usually about maybe like anywhere mm-hmm. from like on average, like 30 to 30 to, you know, 75 days of okay. uh, payback time. So it's kind of like, so when you're talking about shorten cycle, you're talking about just kind of shorting the time to like from when you buy it to like when you get make it a deal of some, some type. Yeah, from the time where you, you invest the money into marketing mm-hmm. to the time where you get some money back in okay. your bank account. Okay, so you were like, okay, it's taking too long. How do I speed up the process? And then you, you mentioned the idea of doing wholesaling. But a lot of my listeners aren't that familiar with wholesaling. So can you kind of give like a refresher on what that is? Yeah, so um, we go to the property owner. We find a property that we like and we, we get in a contract and we assign our our interest in that property to another person, another buyer mm-hmm. who would who would um, 
would basically follow those terms you have in the contract, um, mm -hmm. like the purchase price, the the closing time, the the title company, and all the details of the purchase contract, the underlying co purchase contract, and and me as the as the original buyer would assign that to someone else for a fee. Okay, so it's kind of like okay, so you, so like the, give me so an example might be is like you buy a house for a hundred. Uh, you get it under contract for 100k, and then you might sell it to somebody else at like 120 or 130 or something. Theoretically, yeah. something like that. Something that was more than what we paid for. Right? Yeah, something for more than what you paid for. And then so the advantage of that is, you found the deal, and and then you don't have to do some of the legwork around like like flipping the houses. Exactly. So we're just flipping the paper. The flipping contract. the paper. Yeah. You, you get you're getting essentially paid for essentially like finding the deal. Exactly. And then kind of like highlighting like why it's valuable and how the next person how they can kind of like take advantage of that exactly so we try to find under uh off market deals or under market value deals where we can then assign it for a fee but the end buyer will also be able to take that make money on it right we're not we can't sell it for a super high price but we can sell it for a reasonable price that someone's willing to pay for it to also monetize on it so one of the things is like you, I'm curious, like on the kind of like your story aspect is so you because you you had you got a college degree, you did like you, you went to New York and were working in some type of finance job, and then how did you decide to like okay, I'm gonna make this like a full time like this is now like this is your full time business? How did you go from like doing like finance and doing that, in that world to like making this huge jump into real estate? Yeah, so. To me, that sounds like really like scary. That's a big jump and completely different career. Yeah. So it all started back in Houston when I was working with my friend. We found the first deal, and that first deal was um, when we were we bought we got we got it through the neighborhood. We found it through driving for dollars mm -hmm. method. Um, we bought the property. We owned it. We started to you know create plans to build on it. When we actually started building on it, the the building uh, project. I thought was passive, meaning that I wouldn't have to worry about anything, mm -hmm. became more active. <laughs> At that point, I'm like, okay, I sunk all my money that I had in this thing, like almost everything. Yeah. And the project was failing. So what do I do? Keep my job or try to recoup my savings mm -hmm. that uh, on a project that was failing miserably? That's why I got into it. And I loved the experience. We finished it out, got the paid um, back and I enjoyed it and so I took that first project and did a second one and a third one and grew from there Okay, but you were even though you said like the first project it sounded like there's a lot of ups and downs with that first project You still felt motivated to to do more because my thoughts like this is hard. Why would I do this again? Yeah, it was definitely hard. There was a, a lot of moments where we thought we lost everything uh, We got into some lawsuits with the, the original contractor um, you know, it was taking longer. Everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. Okay. But one thing went right was the market was going up. I see. So when so right now you you started in Houston that first project, but now you've expanded to like Houston, San Antonio, Austin, right? Those are kind yeah. of been like your main regions. Sure. So like when you're, what what made you want to kind of expand out further from like just like the Houston area? Why why not just stick there? Why do you keep expanding? Um. Houston over the years, um, so one of the, the metrics we track is like the cost per acquisition, okay. meaning like how much marketing dollars do we spend and how many deals do we get mm -hmm. from those marketing dollars. Mm -hmm. So over the years, like Houston's, the dollar per um, acquisition cost started increasing over time. I see. And doubling, tripling. And so from my, when I first started. So I was like, um, I heard a lot of stuff about San Antonio. It's, it's, a, it's a smaller market maybe less people, mm -hmm. uh, less interest, but so I just decided to try it out. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so you just, you, you okay, so the, the price got so, much, so expensive, or just like the price or acquisition, you're just, uh, you're just evaluating now, you're like, let, let me look at other opportunities and see if maybe different markets can give different results. Yeah, so can I make more money with less risk, or, you know, what, and just expand my horizon. So doing the deals in, in San Antonio weren't that much difficult more difficult than the ones in Houston, so we just started playing around and, just, and then it started to grow from there. I see. And so now I'm kind of curious too, because like you're, you know, like the, as a, we're kind of in, two, the last few years have been like, it's been a crazy market in the real estate. What's kind of like your thoughts about what do you think is gonna happen with the market, for especially with housing in the next couple of months to a year? Yeah. Because well, you have a really inside knowledge, because you're buying houses all the time, you're selling houses, so you have like a very unique insight. Well, we're in February 2023, okay. and 
there's been a lot of talk about a recession, jobs, you know, mm-hmm. being removed and, and layoffs. So, well, at the end, it looks like in the market that there's a lot of layoffs. We, we all see that Facebook, mm-hmm. Goldman Sachs, you know, mm-hmm. Salesforce. So that's going to affect the pricing of house. The interest rates mm-hmm. have been going up and down, but more up. Um, so that affects the ability to buy properties. It feels like in the summer of this year, there is going to be a an opportunity where prices come down. You know, how fast, you know, when, I don't know. But I think uh, the next one year, starting the summer-ish, we're going to start to see a downward trend. Um, all of our properties that we have are, have been sitting on the market a lot longer than normal, more than, you know, the last two years. So that's definitely, you know, a sign that we're in a downward market. Okay, so you feel... And you think it's going to make, so with this kind of downward trend, if somebody was trying to get into like flipping houses and wholesaling, you think it's going to be easier for somebody who wants to kind of get into that or is it harder? Or what do you think in terms of like like your business, do you think it's going to, like because of this recession, there might be opportunities for investors or what, what's your thoughts on in terms of that? Yeah, so I think in general, um, you know, for someone starting off, you know, you mm-hmm. want to just take the least amount of risk as possible. Okay, so right. what? So what? So what? How? What? What does that mean? So exactly, like, what kind of like? What do you mean by like the least amount of risk? What would that look like? That would look like um, somebody uh, probably just wholesaling a property, or maybe finding mm-hmm. a property and working with someone more experienced uh, on maybe wholesaling it, for okay. example, right? So if if you uh, have a nine to five, maybe you'd work with an experienced wholesaler who knows how to find deals. Uh, in some ways, you can collaborate with them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you going out and spending lots of marketing dollars on something that you're probably not too sure about uh, mm-hmm. might be more risk. So, and that's what you did initially. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I did. But I, the price of the market, the price of mm-hmm. the properties at that time were going up and up and up, right? Mm-hmm. So even if I made a mistake, um, you know, I you was, wouldn't get penalized as badly. I wouldn't get penalized even sometimes at all because uh-huh. of the fact that the market was making uh-huh. it was going up so fast. I see. Okay. So your suggestion is so for someone starting out, it sounds like the, the first step is just to like start working with someone first and collaborating rather than like just going out on your own. Yeah, absolutely. Work with them, maybe be a salesperson for them, you know, try to work in their office in some capacity, joint venture, partner mm-hmm. up. Uh, and, and that way you can learn, you know, the, the ins and outs of the business a bit mm-hmm. more. Uh, in a downward market, it's going to be more expensive, these lessons. You know. Oh, I see what you're saying. So, as if the prices are going up, there's you, you have a little bit more room for like making mistakes. But as it's going down, like you, you can get you can get stuck with a property that you really don't want. Yeah, you need to you need to make better decisions in a downward market, right? Mm-hmm. So one of the things is you mentioned you kind of do a little bit of like both. You both flip, fix up the house or you wholesale and you sell off the contract or you sometimes decide to like keep it and then fix up the house and do it yourself. So how do you go about deciding like when you fix it up or when you wholesale or when you just sell off the contract? That's, yeah, good question. So our main thing is we, we try to fill up our contractor's work um, mm-hmm. with properties and areas that we like. So we want to, so our criteria is like, do we want to do this rehab or not, right? If we want to do this rehab, then do we want to hold this in our portfolio? Um, otherwise, we just want to like kind of sell it off, right? If it doesn't fit like our overall, you know, market strategy, long-term strategy, we just mm-hmm. want to sell, we'll sell those contracts off. So it's okay. pretty simple. Do they fit within our criteria or not? And if not, then we sell them off. One of the things I've just been just knowing you for a while, you're definitely very analytical and you're thinking about KPIs and like so, like what kind of things are you checking for in a deal in terms of like how you evaluate if it's a good deal or not? Good question. So, what's a good deal? Well, we always want to buy properties that um, we can resell quickly. Right? Okay. So, that so can is- we? Bu- are we buying them under market value? Right. Okay. Like yeah. If the market value is a hundred. We try to shoot for like you know sixty five cents to sixty cents on the dollar. Oh, okay, so that's kind of like the way you decide, it's like thirty percent off at least. Yeah, exactly. Right, thirty percent off market value. Because we also need to realize that um, we need to put like twenty cents of work in it usually, right? Okay. So we're all in like at seventy five to eighty cents. Okay, so you're putting okay, so you you know that you're going to put another twenty percent towards the work itself, and then minimum, even if you sell it at market value, you can get like at least 50, 15 cents on the dollar. Yeah, exactly. And then you're hoping with the work that it will be more than what you uh, you've increased the market value. Absolutely. So we have to be double sure of that, right? Okay, so that way, you, you, even if you're slightly wrong, you have a little room for error. 
and in your in your like I guess your algorithm. Yeah. So a lot of wholesalers and buyers are looking at like you know seventy five percent off ARV minus the repairs. So we kind of have our own formula that we look at. But in general, a, a good rule of thumb is plus or minus sixty five cents on the purchase price um, of Zillow. Oh, of Zillow. Okay, so that's a. Okay, Zillow is like a. Do you think do you? So I'm curious about your opinion on Zillow. Like when it comes to like housing values, do you think it's like really accurate, or how do you go about assessing market value? In general, like if if I'm talking to you and you're a seller, right, and you have a, you say you want the house for a hundred grand, you want a hundred grand for it. I look to see is it is that house probably like you know, uh, on Zillow worth like like one seventy or whatever whatever the percentage mm-hmm. is. If you're if you're much greater than that sixty five percent, like you're at eighty percent of Zillow, then I would have to come down, right? Because on average, I know looking at our past history of where we're at on our purchases, we're in between like fifty five and sixty five cents. Okay. Right. So on average, we're buying those houses of a percentage of Zillow, right? Between fifty five and sixty five cents. So. Okay. One of the things that just kind of like just kind of jumped in my head that I'm curious is that why would any why. Well, why don't these like sellers? Why don't they just go with a realtor? Why don't they just sell it on their own? Why Why would they go to you and like say, like sell it at like a lower price? Like why is Why would they? How have you been able to get these get these sellers to to, to sell it to you at a slightly or at a dis, below market value? Well, one, uh, oftentimes they have a lot of title problems, right? So okay. they're not very easy to clear. They might require like probate mm-hmm. or affidavit of hairships. They might they might have uh, they might require an easement to the property mm-hmm. on a piece of land. They um, they're hard to sell, right? Okay. These are properties that are hard to sell. So, but often, so the three reasons why people sell to us is because they're probably going through a probate. Uh, maybe going through a foreclosure or a divorce, mm-hmm. uh, and the fourth, m- most recently, is like landlord or investors who are dealing with tenants that don't pay, mm-hmm. um, and just headache headache issues. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, they're selling to us at a discount because they have headaches. Okay, so that that's the main reason why they sell it to you at a discount is because they have a problem of some time, whether it's like yeah. some title issue, or some tenant, and they were like, "Let me just offload the problem," and the and that. So that's the savings they get, and so the challenge you have is to kind of have to deal with those headaches. Exactly. And that, but you, the the benefit is you get the dis, you get the discounted price. Exactly right, because there's not a lot of buyers that can work through that process like we can. I see. And so you said there we, and I'm really curious about like so you've one of the things I've like kind of learned from you is like how how you've built out a team, and especially one thing is interesting about you is you have like an overseas team, and I'm curious of like. Like how how you your process of like building out a team and what made you want to like go overseas instead of like hiring just people in the in the U.S. Yeah, well, I, um, I did have a lot of people in the U.S. up until 2020 mm-hmm. uh, or around 2020, and then now it's just a little bit less. But I wanted to utilize a a global workforce because um, it was more cost effective. Our revenues mm-hmm. went down, so you know the cost of labor that we had. Um, didn't mm-hmm. support that revenue at that time in 2020. 2020 was uh, the beginning was a really tough year for for me uh, and for us. And so I try to utilize the global uh, labor force uh, to support you know where we were at our business. And so I hired one person and I hired a second and kind of taught mm-hmm. them. And 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 their worth ethic was really good. And and mm-hmm. then I was like inspired to hire more and then eventually grew it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable how like because you're. Like how you've grown, you've now have a team like all over the world, and then you've been able to teach kind of like one of the things I think I've learned from you is kind of like the process of like the team building aspect of the bu- building a culture. And I'm curious, like, what have been kind of like from a team perspective, what kind of processes do you have like in place so that you can have your because you have a lot of you have a lot of properties that you manage, and so it's like tough by yourself to just remember all the little details that go into it. Yeah, I think um, you know having good uh, SOPs or standing operating procedures. So what are what are SOPs? I don't think many people are familiar with that. Is um, it's just uh, creating a um, uh, how, how do you how do you work through a, a critical task? Um, it's just like if someone is able to take that over, they're able to follow through A to Z from maybe filing it, documenting it, you know, mm-hmm. and executing it as if they were the person who's managing it on a daily basis, right? Okay. If you are um, a house, you know, cleaner, like what do you do when you first assess a house, right? You look at the different areas of the house, you assess like what's out of place, in place, you know, talk yeah. to the owner. There's a, there's, it's a standard set of rules 
uh, and steps to execute a task. I see. Like, so if you're cleaning a house, for example, you might think of, okay, like, what are all the main areas to clean? Like, maybe order of operations, what areas to clean first, and then maybe, like, how the house, like, what kind of like, materials you might need to clean a, a standard house and how long it would typically take. Something yeah. kind of like that. Yeah, so maybe, like, a, a general standard operating procedure could have, like, a purpose, maybe a vision, mm -hmm. a goal, and, a, like, a KPI associated to it. So the person who's doing it could realize, okay, so if we have a 2,000-square-foot house, we don't want to spend more than, like, 10 hours on it, right? There might be, like, you're probably going to spend, you know, plus or minus, like, two hours on it. And, and then the steps, the vision, you know, the vision of what okay. the, of the goal of the task is. I see. Now, one of the things is, like, at least in, in the Austin area in particular, or just in Texas in general, is that, like, affordability is, is becoming harder and harder. Uh, every, just in general, houses are just become. that's why there's, it's kind of becoming, there's just, it's really hard to be a land, or just to be a property owner now yeah. because of that. And so I've heard other, I've heard other prof real estate professionals talk about how, like, sometimes, like, wholesalers are kind of, like, driving the prices and making it kind of, like on a, unaffordable for like first time home buyers. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Like do you kind of agree on some point that they're kind of like driving up the prices of houses and make it more unaffordable? I think what wholesalers are doing are providing liquidity mm -hmm. to a seller, right? What are they really doing? They're taking the, the seller's contract and reselling it uh, or signing it for a fee, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to an end buyer. So what they're essentially doing is creating a market for that property that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So in any ways, if let's say, for example, you need to sell your house mm -hmm. and you, need, you have 30 days because there's a foreclosure, the typical process of selling this house would probably be go put on the MLS, use a realtor, right, that they're going to they're gonna take X amount of percentage of the mm -hmm. sale. But if you had an outlet to do this in two to three weeks where you could just sell it fast, move on to your life, uh, move on to the next phase of your life, that could be val more valuable mm -hmm. to you, right? And so working with a wholesaler, working with the cash buyer mm -hmm. in that way allows you to be able to move quicker. Yeah. Right? And so a cash buyer like a wholesaler and like any other potential buyer out there creates another opportunity for you to, to exploit or to exit out of, right, to use uh, to, make, to see if that makes sense. So in a lot of ways, yeah. giving you more optionality. I see. I see what you're saying because yeah, it's not like houses aren't like stocks. You can't just sell it tomorrow. Like it's not easy to. It's not easy to unload the property or like get rid of it. And it's like stocks. You can like the next day you could sell it and and be and get it and just easily get rid of it. And the liquidity on stocks is a lot. It's a lot quicker. But with houses, you can't like you really can't like move it quickly. And so something like a wholesaler kind of help in that area. Yeah, absolutely right. I think so, right? They they provide another option out there that you didn't have. Okay, so I'm curious as like what you think from like a wholesaler m market. Like, how do you think the the industry? How how you think is going to change in there? Or do you think anything's going to change in the upcoming years for like people who want to get into wholesaling? Is it now gotten more competitive or less competitive? I'm curious. Um, I think the last couple of years, as the, mar the prices have gone up so high that more and more people were attracted to wholesaling. But now that we're coming to a, a new shift in the market, um, one that we haven't seen for like over 10 years, you know, the mm -hmm. price is coming down. You're going to see less and less people, you know, be willing to take that fi uh, financial marketing risk, right? Those dollars to spend and the time for what? Their, their future mm -hmm. is uncertain. So you probably have to spend two times as much, maybe even mm -hmm. three times as much to generate the same amount of income as you once did before. I see. So it may not be, so you have a feeling there's going to be a huge drop off. There could be a big drop off. Also the expertise, uh, the experience level, um, since a lot of people who, who started, you know, coming into this industry were newer, um, they may be the first ones to leave, right? They're maybe not as committed. So there will be a gap in the marketplace with that gap is going to create opportunity for the people who stay. Okay. Okay, so I see what you're saying. It's kind of like, it kind of reminds me of like being a realtor um, and the fact that like when the house prices are rising and there's a lot of houses available, everyone wants to become a realtor. But then when the market starts to fall a little bit, all of a sudden everyone gets out of being a realtor and no longer wants to be one. So you're kind of, it's kind of like a similar market. And you feel in the next coming year that like, because there's the potential of a recession that there's going to be a huge drop off of people who want to flip houses or do wholesaling. Wholesaling, maybe uh, maybe houses on the back end too as well. Yeah, because there'll be less properties 
um, you know, being bought, right? So it, it, it seems like wholesalers and realtors, they're really closely aligned. We're both focusing mm -hmm. on that seller. Mm -hmm. um, so in markets that are going up, lots of both of mm -hmm. them, those participants, and then now as the market's going down, they're going to be less. So it could be like if you create a niche or focus, you could you know, t be making more money because now people know you. I see. And so a lot, a lot, how are you, so I'm curious, how are you finding a lot of your deals? Like what have you, because you mentioned you drive for dollars is how you got initially started, but yeah. now how, how are you kind of getting started now? Or like, how are you marketing your, like pe to people? Yeah. So we have a couple main marketing channels. Um, one of them is cold calling direct to the owner. Okay. Um, we do a lot of, we still do SMS, not a huge amount, but we do SMS consistently every week. Um, the third one is our, our direct mail campaigns mm -hmm. um like postcards you mm -hmm. know to to sellers and then we have a small email marketing kind of strategy as well so just those four main uh outreach channels and then we also you know the fifth being like you know working with realtors other wholesalers partnering up working together um because they're out there you know reaching out to sellers okay. right so we create that fifth channel as like a, a relationship marketing. Okay. Do you do also um, what do you call? It? I see these sometimes like signs. We buy houses, like this kind of signs or something like that. We buy cheap houses. We buy ugly houses. Stuff like signs like that. You do that as well. Uh, banded signs. Um, we banded? don't. Okay. Yeah, we don't. We don't do any banded signs, but they they can attract like buyers and sellers just generally. Yeah, There's, they get a mm -hmm. they get a lot of uh, calls. Okay, they get you a lot of calls, but you don't think they're very productive calls a lot of times. So we try, yeah. So there, the quality of the call could be kind of low. I see, but it might be for some. It's an easy marketing to do. If you're yeah. Start. So I'm curious, like, yeah, if if I were to start off, because my one of the things that in my head that pops up is like, oh, I need a bunch of money to like get started doing this. How, like, not anyone can just do this. You got to have money to get started. Yeah, you you know, it's either time or money. Pick okay. one. So if you don't have any money, you have to spend time to 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 put band inside. So maybe do like. You know, online, you know, marketing uh, mm -hmm. to, on Facebook and, and, and all the different websites, right? So you either have to spend time or money. It's only one of the two. I see. So if you, so if you have money, how do you approach? If you, if you're starting, so let me restart this. So say if you're just you're starting out, you don't have, you don't have much money. Like, what are kind of the like steps if you were to start all over again and you don't have much money? How would you kind of get started in your head? Um, I would first go to a lot of the real estate investor meetings uh, okay. in the local, like, in like Austin. meetups and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, just get immersed, talk to as many people, um, and then you know listen to a bunch of podcasts like this one. Try to understand the industry, mm -hmm. and um, you know try to set set times to talk to older people, people right. that are more experienced. Just you know try to get, grab coffee or and meet them mm -hmm. at the meetups. So the more in the beginning, just network for the first three months aggressively. Okay. Try to figure out a niche. Once you figure out a niche, once you find those successful mm -hmm. people, maybe work underneath them. Okay, and then work from work underneath them, and then maybe like start taking, going out on your own. You don't because you you kind of went out on your own and did it from scratch. But that's not something you'd recommend if you had to do it over. That's not something you'd recommend. Yeah, I think you can go faster with some um, guidance. Okay, so it's best to like partner up with somebody and see yeah. if you can. That's the 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 most optimal way. Yeah, absolutely. Because that way you're you're not having to make the same mistakes they made, and then you can do it on maybe their dime or like at least at least the risk is kind of like split. Yeah. But isn't that when? So my thought is, is that's going to be tough to like have to build enough trust that someone wants to like do a co-partner and deal with somebody. And you got to take less percentage. It's not like a, it's not a it's not a joint venture fifty fifty. You might take ten percent, and they take ninety. But I you see. know what? You're learning. You know, the first six months is not going to determine your career. It's just the first six mm -hmm. months of of your of going to you know, going to university. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. I see what you're saying. So yeah, you may not get like a 50, 50 split and you may have, but you're not also, you're probably not taking as much risk and then you're not having to make the same type of mistakes that if you did it on your own. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. I think that's just important in general. Like if you want to become successful in anything, it's best to like work with people that are a lot more experienced than you. So that that way they can keep you from making yeah. the dumb mistakes that they made when they were learning. Exactly. Yeah. So I want to kind of like wrap things up, but how, uh, if people want to get in contact with you for like any type of like wholesaling questions or like become like maybe if you need looking for investors or anything or any type of plugs that you want to like have, you have any way for people to reach out to you? Yeah, um, they can always find me on Facebook. Um, pretty easy. My first name is Nakul, N A K U L, mm -hmm. and then my last name is Kongovi, K O N G O V I. 
You can also search that on Instagram. I'm on mm-hmm. there. I used to post a lot. I'm coming back to it again. <laughs> uh, but um, that you just search for my full name again. You'll find me as under the Millennial Developer. Millennial Developer. Okay. <laughs> I'll make sure to include all of those in the the show notes or in the description of this video down below. So that way you can, if you want to get in contact with them uh, in some form for questions or in any way, then you have the ability to do so. Um, so with that, I'm going to kind of wrap things up. Um, please guys like this video, subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any more of this great content.